Welcome to this online lesson on Richard Arkwright, the factory system and child labour during the Industrial Revolution. Our aim today is to use sources to investigate how factories changed working life. Here's a do now task for you. Where do you think you get more work done? At home or at school? Explain why you think this is and be ready to discuss. However, before you do that, just consider this. When I originally formulated that as a do now question, I had not imagined all the home learning that you would have been doing up to this point. And so actually, you're probably very well placed to decide where you really do more work. Is it at home or is it at school? Decide now, note down your answer and explain why. Pause the video while you do this. Okay, I don't know what answer you've put, but in the past when I've asked this question, the majority of people in my class have admitted that they do more work at school than they do at home. They feel more motivated because their teacher is watching over them, ready to help, but also ready to encourage them to move along if they're being a little bit lazy and a little bit slow. In a similar sense, people were having an adjustment to their working lives during the Industrial Revolution. There was a move from people mostly working at home or in the countryside to people working in towns and cities within large buildings called factories. One of the earliest factories that we might recognise as a factory today is shown in the picture at the top. This is Richard Arkwright's textile mill. More on him later. We're going to do a quick comparison now. Study these two sources and identify at least one similarity and between three to five differences between them. Source one shows women working at home making wool thread. This is from around 1750. You can see that the woman is working on a spinning wheel and she's working next to the window where she's got plenty of light. In the background we can see an older woman who's uh, reeling the, uh, the thread that's been made onto a cotton reel and we can see another woman at the back, possibly a young girl actually, doing some cooking. Source 2 shows people making cotton thread in a factory in around 1771, so there's not a lot of time that separates them. Pause the video while you complete that task, and then we'll discuss some of the things that you might have seen. Okay, so one similarity that you might have noticed is the big wheels. Those wheels power the machines. In the case of the one on the left in source one, it's simply a hand-driven wheel which allows for one thread to be made at a time from the wool. On the other hand, the wheels in the 1777, uh, 1771 sorry, picture show wheels that are powering much larger machines. Also another similarity is that they're both making wooden thread, but actually there are lots more differences. For example, Source 1 shows women working actually at home rather than in a factory. There's no one there telling them what to do, they're just doing it. After all, if they don't do the work, they won't be able to sell their wool and they won't get any money. On the other hand, in the factory, these people would not have been selling their own wool. You'll notice as well that the machines are allowing them to, uh, to spin many more threads of wool at one time. So one operator, and notice that some of them do look very young, are actually making multiple threads and these are automatically being reeled onto reels without someone else having to do it. This is a much more efficient way of working and much more wool would be uh, reeled onto those cotton uh, bobbins uh, much more quickly than would have been in the home setting in Source 1. Crucially though, notice the guy with the tri-corner hat standing in the middle, looking quite stern. He would be the foreman of the factory floor and would be ensuring that all of those workers were earning their money. Notice too that the big wheels are powering the machines but they're still hand driven. People are having to wind these themselves. Steam and water power would come later. Which one would you rather work in? I'm pretty sure I'd rather work in the, uh, the home environment rather than having someone telling me what to do. But this new way of working was going to become very familiar to people. Someone who uh, can kind of take some of the credit for this new way of working is a man called Richard Ar Arkwright. You can see him pictured here. This is where we got this crucial transition between people working at home to working in factories for someone else. Before the Industrial Revolution, people involved in manufacturing, and this means making things, usually worked at home. They worked whenever they liked and sold much of what they produced themselves. This was known as a cottage industry. So write your own definition for the term cottage industry. Pause the video while you complete that.
Later, in 1769, Richard Arkwright changed this. He invented a spinning frame which could spin lots of threads at once. This is what you saw in Source 2 on the previous slide. It was so big and needed so much power from a water wheel, or smaller ones could be hand, hand cranked, that it had to be housed in a manufactory. This is where we get the term factory from. A manufactory is a place where things are made, and we just shorten it to factory these days. He soon started employing people in his first large factory, which he opened in 1771. Firstly, how do you think working in a factory may have made people's lives different in terms of how much work they did, where they lived and worked, and how much money they earned? Finally, and as an extension, do you think people were happier in the factory? You might also want to take some notes about Richard Arkwright and what he invented. Pause the video while you complete those tasks. So let's consider these different points. How much work they did. Well, let's not kid ourselves that people who lived in cottage industries were somehow lazy. If they were lazy, they wouldn't have enough wool to sell and therefore they would go hungry. So they probably worked very hard. Well, one of the difficulties they would have had is that you would only really have been able to work during the daylight hours. So in the summer, your days would have been very long, but in the winter, the days might have been rather shorter as you wouldn't have been able to see what you were doing so well as it got dark so early. However, in the factories, they would have produced an awful lot more. It doesn't mean they necessarily worked that much harder. The difference is that they simply produced a lot more using the machines on an individual basis. The trick was, of course, that they produced more, but they didn't get to sell it themselves. What about where they lived and worked? Well, with the cottage industry, you're doing your work at home. So your home was also your workplace. However, in a manufacturing, you would need to travel to the factory. This might involve what we would today term as a commute, but most people would need to live very nearby, within walking distance. And so this meant that people had to move nearer to the factories if they wanted to work there. In addition to that, a large factory like Arkwright's would put the cottage industries out of business. So it might be that you had little option to work in the factory and uh, or go hungry. What about how much money they earned? Well, the truth is, because the people in cottage industries didn't get to produce that much wool, they still wouldn't have earned that much money. But the fact of the matter was, in a manufactory, huge quantities of thread and textiles could be produced. But most of that money went to the mill owner who had invested in it, and very little of that money was given back to the workers in uh, to pay them back for their labour. Only really enough that would prevent them from uh, working elsewhere if they were offered better terms. But overall, most of these factories offered very low pay for very long hours of work. So were people happier in the factories? Largely not, it would seem. Indeed, people who worked in cottage industries sometimes protested about these new machines coming in. A famous group of these were known as the Luddites. These people would actually vandalise new pieces of equipment, hoping that that would stop them uh, outcompeting them when it came to the cottage industries. A Luddite is a term that we use today to refer to someone who's kind of afraid of new technology. Child labour in factories is another way that the manufacturers increase their profits. Indeed, in a time before much formal schooling, this was reality for many children. What you're going to do with this task is you're going to create a table like this one here. You may need a large piece of paper or a double page spread in a book. There's a reason why Source 1's entry has got wider spacing here. It's simply because I'm going to give you some sample answers. But you'll need to leave plenty of space for all of these. So it might be good to just do the headings and then to add the sources one at a time. However, we're going to consider four different sources in total. The heading should be the source. The work that children did. And this is information that you can get from the sources. The dangers that children faced. Again, information you get from the sources. And then you can consider whether or not this source is trustworthy. Can you believe what it's telling you? Whatever your answer, say why. We'll do the first example together, and then you'll hopefully be able to do the others a little bit more independently. My opinion in being asked about the health of children being employed in the spinning factories under the present system, I have no hesitation in declaring, after many years of observation, that it is not unusual for children to be restricted in growth, deformed in their legs and to be affected with coughs so that they die of consumption. This is uh, tuberculosis, a disease of the lungs. This is a consequence of their long confinement in heated, ill-ventilated rooms and being constantly on their legs for their long hours, often 12 or more hours of labour. 
This is Source 1. It is by Thomas Bellett, who was a doctor, uh, and he's reporting on the health of child factory workers in a nationwide report on child labour. This was written in 1818. Take a moment to consider what information this gives you. You might not be able to fill in every single column on this, but you should be able to fill in most of them. Give it a try now, and then we'll see my example, and you can fill in any blanks that you've left. Pause the video now while you do this. OK, if you struggle with this, there might be a good reason for it, so let's have a look at my answers. What information does this give us about the work that children did? Well, aside from saying that they did long hours, it doesn't actually say anything. And that's fine. If you are looking for something in a source and it's simply not there, you cannot make it up. So you could just put for that section, no details given in this source. However, it does give us lots of details about the dangers that children faced. Health problems, disease, poor growth, caused by ventilation and heat at work, and the long length of their hours. All right, I'm hopeful that you've maybe have given a more detailed answer than that because you've got more space to write than I have on this screen. After all, it's becoming very cluttered already. But then is this source trustworthy? Well, I think it is quite trustworthy. It was written at the time by a doctor who would have had experience in diagnosing these problems. I could back that up further with a quote. Have a look where it says, I have no hesitation in declaring after many years of observation. So this doctor has been working in this sector for a long time and has therefore built up a wealth of knowledge and experience of what went on. That suggests that actually this would be quite a reliable way of, go of uh, quite a reliable source on this. Now let's consider child labour in factories in more detail. Here we've got an engraving from the early 19th century. Uh, the 19th century being the 1800s. An engraving was an early sort of printable image. It was engraved into a plate which could then be covered in ink and then stamped on paper repeatedly. It shows child workers producing cotton reels. I've been unable to get a specific date for this and I've also been unable to get an artist's name or organisation for this work. However, let's consider the information that this does give us. Again, you'll need to fill in the work that children did, hopefully you'll have a little bit more detail from this source, the dangers that children faced, and whether or not this source is trustworthy. Give it some thought and pause the video while you do that. So, I'm going to give you a few extra pointers here. This is not going to be as detailed as hopefully you've produced, but if you're missing any of these key details, do add them to your answer now. The work shown is that children produce reels of cotton thread for use in factories. We can see these conical reels on the table in front of them, and the children are taking the thread off that large spindle at the top. In terms of dangers that the children are faced, actually it's not quite as useful as the last one. However, a factory manager is shown on the left. He tells the children what to do. Some of those people could be cruel, although it has to be said that this person isn't drawn looking particularly cruel in this picture. There is dangerous machinery nearby. The spindle at the top might be a place where children could get, get uh, their limbs tangled, but it wouldn't have been spinning very quickly in this case. Instead, there are better examples of the dangers that children would face than we might get from this source. So on its own, perhaps it's not the most useful source we've got. Is it trustworthy? Well, it's problematic. It was made at the time, it looks reasonably realistic, but we don't know who made it and why. Perhaps it was made by people who were saying that children were being well treated in factories. That's why none of the children looked distressed and the, pe the other people in there looked like they're treating them pretty well. On the other hand, it might have even been made by a group of people who are against child labour. It's difficult to tell just on the information that we've been given. Let's have a look at another source so we can fill in some of our blanks. Before we do, I'm going to show you this. This is a more modern version of the spinning frame that Richard Arkwright invented. Instead of only spinning about 12 threads, this one can spin, as can spin hundreds at a time. It's known as a spinning mule. It's also an automated machine. You can see that there are bands running from wheels up to the roof. What would happen is that this machine would take thread, and you can see the threads uh, that are at the top there, or rather on the left, and create threads by spinning them onto cotton reels. This large frame, and you can see the wheels on it, would slide first out and then back in. But that's the dangerous moment. 
One of the jobs that people were employed to do was as scavengers. As the machine worked, fluff would fly off of the spindles and gather on the floor. This could clog up the machinery, and it could also cause a fire hazard. Nevertheless, there was another use to it. Any reclaimed wool could be put back into the carding machines and turned back into more thread. And even if it wasn't wool, the same could be done for cotton. And in fact, looking at it, I believe that this is actually a cotton uh, spinner rather than a wool spinner. The problem is, as that frame rolls back in, there's no way of stopping it, and it weighs roughly a ton. So if you don't get out of the way in time, and bear in mind that you've got threads above your head that you wouldn't be able to get through, well, you're quite simply going to be crushed. And that was a genuine and quite common danger. So who would be sent underneath there? Let's be honest, it's going to be the children more often than not, because they would have been smaller and able to do so. I've put in the, a uh, link in the description to this video showing a, uh, a spinning jenny in action. You can see how noisy and dangerous it is. Although in this modern reconstruction, no children are having to run underneath to scavenge the, the extra cotton fibres. Let's consider another source now. This was written by a surgeon who is describing his work in a uh, factory infirmary in 1819. An infirmary is basically a, a sort of hospital. When I was a surgeon in the infirmary, accidents were very often admitted to the infirmary through the children's hands and arms having been caught in the machinery. In many instances, the muscles and the skin is stripped down to the bone, and in some instances, a finger or two might be lost. Last summer, I visited Lever Street School. The number of children at that time in the school who were employed in the factories was 106. The number of children who had received injuries from the machinery amounted to very nearly one half. There were 47 injured in this way. If you've seen the images and the video of the spinning jenny, you can probably understand how children could easily get their fingers trapped in the spinning wheels or even get crushed by the machine itself as it operated. So, for Source 3, what work did the children do? What dangers did they face? And is the source trustworthy? Pause the video while you work that out. Okay, hopefully you've come up with some good stuff. Let's have a look at my pointers just in case you haven't. So the children worked in mills with dangerous machinery. However, the dangers they faced were very serious and they were, had, had potentially fatal injuries. Rip muscles, skin loss, amputation of fingers and possibly limbs. High, almost 50% accident rate. It's worth bearing in mind that with the medical standards of this day, infection could very often kill children who had suffered these things, and if you needed a, a crushed limb amputated, you had about a 50% chance of surviving that operation. A very, very grim statistic indeed. So is this trustworthy? Well, it's reasonably reliable. The surgeon would keep records of their work, and these statistics are detailed and can be checked. For example, he lists the exact number of people at the school and the exact number of injuries, and so that seems pretty trustworthy to us. It was also written at the time of events, which is another reason why this might be considered reliable and trustworthy. Let's have a look at our final source. Here's source 4. It's another one of those engraving pictures. This is a mid-19th century engraving showing a child being crushed by a factory machine. Again, if you've seen the video of the spinning jenny, you can probably understand this. This was produced by a group that opposed child labour. In other words, they were against children working in factories. Let's fill in these sections again. Pause the video while you do so. Again, here's some basic ideas that you might want to add in case you've missed anything. So children worked as mule scavengers, collecting fluff to be reused. In terms of dangers, children worked around powerful machinery, such as spinning mules. The trapped child was probably one of these mule scavengers. In fact, you might be able to see some of the fluff has got entangled in him. Is this source trustworthy? Well, reasonably, but it's not without a few problems. It was made at the time. It shows a known danger that children faced, but it was made by an anti-child labour group who might have wanted to exaggerate the dangers. Although there were plenty of records for these sorts of things going on, so perhaps it's difficult to exaggerate. There are some other features within this source which might seem a little bit more exaggerated though and maybe a little bit melodramatic and overplayed to our modern eyes. For example, look at the children comforting each other in the front. The meanwhile, a woman is carrying on with her work attending to the threads. 
And the men at the back, presumably the foreman and factory owners, don't seem to be paying any attention at all. We'd have to consider whether that's a realistic portrayal of how they would be behaving. Let's do some follow-up tasks. Review the information that you've gathered from the four sources. Which source did you find most useful for learning about children in factories? Explain your choice. The most useful source is the one that contains the most relevant and most trustworthy information. So, if you're investigating children in factories, make sure the information contained within it tells you about children in factories, preferably both the dangers they faced and the sorts of work that they did in there. Also, when it comes to it being trustworthy, make sure you choose a source that combines having good information with information that you can trust. If it's obviously biased or it's got some sort of other motive, then perhaps you need to be doubtful about that. So look for the best common theme between good information that you can trust. That's what makes it useful. Secondly, why do you think employers hired children to work in factories? And then B, why did children and families actually agree to work in these factories? Then lastly, with the notes that you've made so far and those answers, write a story about child workers in a mill. It doesn't have to be very long and perhaps could take the form of a diary entry. This could be done in the first person, with a child describing what it was like. Although made up, it should include realistic examples of the work that kids did, accidents that happened to them, rules that they had to follow, and how they feel doing the work. If you wanted to extend this even further, you could do some of your own research and try and get some real first-hand accounts of children working in factories. Remember that actually children work in factories in some parts of the world to this day, so understanding this part of our history can help shine a light on the, the modern world too. Pause the video while you complete those tasks. So which source did you choose as your most useful? I'm not going to tell you which one I think is most useful, but just consider this. Source 1 has got some really good de details of the dangers and is pretty reliable, but it doesn't tell us anything about the work that they do. Source 2 is better in that respect in terms of giving us an idea as to who did the work, but it's not particularly reliable because you don't know who made it. Source 3 is a bit better on both points. It doesn't give us great information about the sort of work that children did, but it is quite reliable in terms of its, uh, its information on the sort of injuries that they sustained and who wrote it. And lastly, source four. It gives us good details as to what uh, the children did as work and some of the dangers that they faced, but we've got to be a little bit cautious because it was made by a group that were against child labour. So why did the employers hire children? Well, for one thing, these children were needed as extra help in those factories but typically they got paid an awful lot less. So children were very cheap labour for these factory owners. So why did families agree to this? Their low wages meant that actually they kind of needed the children's money in order to top up their family income. Otherwise they might not be able to keep a roof over their heads and food in their bellies. Not only that, this is a time before much formalised schooling, particularly for the poor. So there wasn't really a lot of extra option. In terms of your stories, I hope that you found that interesting writing them. But let's conclude now. Finally, describe cottage industries. Explain why factories could make their owners very wealthy. Explain why factories might have been bad for the children and other workers who worked in them. And then lastly, give an opinion. No wrong answer for this, but were factories a good thing? Pause the video while you complete those. All right then. If you are unable to answer parts one to three, you need to review sections of this video and of this lesson until you can do so. For part four though, were factories a good thing? Well, that's very much a matter of perspective. It didn't do an awful lot for the rights and the lives of the workers, but they did need employment and this did provide it for them. For the work, work mill owners, it was very good news. They made an awful lot of money from it. And in a wider sense, this represents a very vast technological leap, which ultimately built the modern world that we live in today. So, despite the suffering of the workers, we are actually living off some of the benefits that it has given us in the future, which might be a slightly uncomfortable thought. But there's no wrong answer to that, as I said. You can say that the factories were a good thing or a bad thing. The key thing is that you actually back it up with some examples. And that's the end of the lesson. Thanks very much for watching. I hope that that was useful to you. And if it was, give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, goodbye.